Good evening, and thank you for having us here. My name is David Tucker, and I'm with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm the Operations Section Chief for the Rogue River Basin Projects, and also Assistant to Jim Buck, who is our Operations Project Manager. The reason that we're here is to talk inundation maps and to give a look ahead of another presentation, very similar to this one, but more in depth, that our Portland-based dam safety section is going to be giving again on the 21st of September and the 22nd of September. As the title slide alludes to, this is an update to inundation maps. Uh, while we've had inundation maps that are specific to the Applegate and the Lost Creek facilities, while we've had those since those facilities were constructed, the Corps of Engineers has recently completed an effort to update these maps with the latest tools that we have at our disposal. So we saw this as an opportunity to provide that information to community members and open up that discussion of the risk that's posed to communities downstream of our facilities. So this is a type of conversation that we don't get to have very often in much detail. And these inundation maps are really a powerful tool to help us guide that message and help make sure that you guys get all of your questions answered as to what is that risk and, and what does it entail. The inundation maps in a nutshell are a description of how much water will go where and how long it's going to take to get there in a worst case catastrophic dam failure scenario. And as you might imagine, this is somewhat sensitive information, so distribution of the information is limited. Because that distribution is limited, we wanted to do this public outreach to provide the opportunity to the community members to come in and take a look at the maps. And we will not be able to distribute copies if that's something that you're interested in. So we do want to make sure that the word is getting out there that the maps are viewable and <coughs> trying to make that as easy for people to access as we can. Now, information without action is not entirely useful to us. So, for the first slide, I just wanted to call to mind that there are some additional people that we're going to need to involve in putting into action some of the information that we're presenting here today. You might notice that community members are presented in bold caps. Hello? 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 Yes. <laughs> so, just to plant a seed for this slide, with that we'll move on to some of the meat of, uh, of the briefing here. Now when we talk about the risk that's associated to the community members, there's a couple of components that we need to address so that we can get a good understanding of what that risk is. And the two components of that are how likely is something to happen and what are the consequences if that eventuality should come about. Again, once we have that understanding, we've got our minds wrapped around what that means, then we can start putting into plan or, or putting into action some some things that will help us be prepared and respond to these scenarios. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the likelihood. So when we look at the statistics of dam failure, some of the things that we've come up with is that there's about a 1 in 10,000 chance of any particular dam failing in any particular year for dams that are older than five years. That's one hundredth of one percent, so another way of saying that is we're ninety nine point nine nine percent sure that we're not going to have a problem such as this. But to, to put that in another perspective, if we have a group of twelve thousand people and we're going about our <coughs> business for eighty years, there's about a similar chance that one of <coughs> us in that group of twelve thousand people is going to be hit by lightning over that eighty year time span. So that's the likelihood side of the argument. We've got essentially a low likelihood of the catastrophic worst case dam failure scenario. When we're looking at these worst case scenarios, 
there's a number of different ways the dams can fail, and this is giving us an idea of the percentage of failures by type of failure mode. The top three are some modes that tend to take a little bit longer to occur, and the bottom two, the slides and earthquakes, are those failure modes that tend to happen a little bit more quickly. That being said, there's no situation in which we're looking at an instantaneous vaporization of a dam. These are all taking some time to develop and progress. To all of these different scenarios probably makes sense. Oh, excuse me. Uh, maybe the one that's not immediately obvious is piping. So just a, a couple of words on that. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So just a couple of words on piping. Uh, the way that that happens is if you have one side of the dam that's wet and then the other side that's dry, piping is a scenario in which a path from the wet side to the dry side, whether it's mid-level on the dam or deep underneath it or whatever, you've got some path that becomes wet all the way through from one side to the other and then water can start moving along that path. As the water moves along that path, then it starts to capture some of the materials that are around that path and transports that material away that can then over time progress into a failure scenario. So with the bottom two failure mechanisms maybe being of uh, greatest concern, you can see that those represent together about 5% of the type of failure mode that we see with, uh, with earth, bank, uh, earth embankment dams. And this is the type of dam that we have for Lost Creek and for Applegate. When we're talking 5% of 1 in 10,000, that's a pretty low likelihood, generally speaking. So that's the likelihood side <coughs> of risk. When we're looking at consequence, this is what the inundation maps are really designed to tell us. The inundation maps are supposed to give us that visual cue of where the water goes and how quickly it gets there. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of information on here. We've got some blue and uh, some slight pink shaded areas. We've got uh, a legend on there. We've got a table, a lot of different information. So what I'd like to do is to walk you through some of these individual elements to make sure that we've all got a common understanding of how to interpret what these maps are trying to tell us. So the first thing are probably the most obvious, these blue and pink shaded areas. These areas on the map represent areas of land that would be underwater in this worst case dam failure scenario. Both of those situations are modeled in scenarios where the dam has been filled to its fullest capacity. The difference between those two is that the blue shaded area represents the dam giving way with a full pool under a blue sky and nothing additional contributing to the situation. So that water that's coming downstream is just what's held back behind the dam. When we look at the pink shaded areas, that represents that failure scenario happening under a large precipitation event or a rain on snow melt type event where you get the water that's behind the dam and added to that is what's running off of the hills or falling out of the sky. The red pentagonal shapes with the numbers in there are a quick key in terms of time. So wherever you see that icon on the map, that's a estimate in numbers of hours of how long it would take for that failure wave to reach the point on the map where you see that red pentagonal shape. Blue square with the black numbers in it are river miles, and that's a measurement of distance from the dam following the path of the river downstream. And then at the bottom, there's a black bar with a letter on it. Those are uh, what we refer to as cross-section markers. And those cross-section markers marry up with tables that are on the map. And those tables show 
what the depth of the water will be at that marker at what time. We've got a number of other elements on the map. These are pretty standard uh, representations if you're familiar at all with maps and they'll identify roads and airports and such. This is the failure wave data. This is the table that corresponds to those cross-section markers that I mentioned on the previous slide. So, for instance, if we were to look at a cross-section marker on the map for cross-section C, and then we wanted to know what the maximum failure event represented, we would see that at that cross-section marker, that wave would get there in just over an hour, the surface of that wave would be at elevation 1394, and when we're talking elevation, we're talking feet above sea level. Once that initial failure wave reaches that 1394 elevation at that marker, the water will continue to rise for another couple of hours until we get to our peak time which would be three hours, and the deepest that, or, or the highest point that we would see that surface of the water reaching would be 1469. Can I ask a question? So our, our I believe our city's elevation is 1440? 1440, okay. 1440, and, and where is that established point at? So I can kind of get a reference to, when I see 1469, because I live on the river, which I think, uh, in reference to three hours later, how much higher that would be than where the data point is right. for 1440. So those cross-section markers are indicated on the separate maps that we have. Um, that I can tell you just from memory, point C is about a mile and a half downstream of the Highway 62 bridge. Okay. The road. Uh, point B is a point about 300-ish feet just upstream of the intersection of Highway 62 and the Tiller Trail Highway. Thank you. Sir. Again, here's just another look at the inundation map, putting much of this information together. Just kind of going back to the question that you asked. Cross section C here. Here's our table with the C data on it. Mm -hmm. And we did bring some maps over here that <coughs> you can look at once get done talking this, uh, talking this briefing and asking or answering whatever questions you may have. So again, information without action doesn't do us a whole lot of good. And how do you know when to take action? That's what this slide is about. So you know, how do we communicate to community members that we've got an issue developing at the dam. And essentially it boils down to, we call 911. And then that 911 dispatcher will be in touch with whatever appropriate emergency response organizations need to be notified per the plans that are going to be, that, that either already exist or need to be revised or need to be developed, whatever the case may be. For sudden events, it's important to know that there is no early warning system so one of the things that's making the rounds or being uh, given a lot of attention is a possible Cascadia subduction, subduction zone earthquake. In that kind of an event where you feel the ground really shaking underneath your feet, you're just going to want to head to high ground and not wait for that notification. And then once you're there, wait until you get word that everything's okay. Back to the earlier slide, <coughs> our work is not done once we're done with these informational meetings. We're just somewhat along the way. And we're going to need everybody's help to make sure that we're as prepared as we can be for this type of, of a situation. And that's the end of the presentation that I have for you. So, oh, I'm interested in the monitoring system. <coughs> um, do you have like lasers that measure any kind of abnormal uh, flexures of the structure so that you can predict a failure very early on? Uh, the way that we would predict uh, that we would detect a failure mode would be through visual inspection 
We do have an annual program where we get surveyors that come out and go to specific monuments or marker points around the project to determine whether or not the dam is shifting upstream, downstream, rising, falling on many different points. So strictly visual, there's no electronic you know, <coughs> um, placements of the markers to see if there is a, a minor shift millimeter. There component. are, there is some very limited automated systems. Uh, mostly it's going around on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, on a yearly basis, and physically inspecting specific points on the dam to make sure that water levels underneath the dam are not rising or falling rapidly, or that the structure is not changing physically in any way. Yeah. Um, I couldn't see, I can't see the dam. Okay. Approximately, in a catastrophic, catastrophic failure, approximately how much time will it take the water to come down the river, say, to the bridge? So, to Shadyco Bridge. Oh, yeah. Out within an hour and a half. So here, uh, cross section C. One hour. <coughs> One hour. Your cross section C about an hour and a minute. Cross section B about an hour. <coughs> now these are these are you know estimates. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want to tag on to Steve's uh, comment here. Uh, the, the base flood elevation of my house is 1476. <coughs> That's five feet above the ground. So, worst case, I'm going to have 90 feet of water. Is that right? Yes, Tom. Um, I, I think just in general, maybe not right at this specific location, but the town of Shady Cove could expect to be 100 feet underwater, taking into account about where the river is today. Okay. So, okay. we're not talking about inches. We're talking about a significant hole of water. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kevin asked about, uh, do we have something electronic that would tell us, you know, moment by moment, uh, millimeter by millimeter? Uh, we don't have that. What we do have is a, a robust inspection system. Uh, Dave is, is a part of that. Uh, once a month he goes not only to Lost Creek but also Applegate. We have uh, basically wells, we call them piezometers that measure the, uh, or we measure the depth of the uh, water. Dams uh, are not leak free. All dams leak some. And uh, we measure that on a monthly basis since the beginning of, of the dam construction. When the uh, reservoir is full, the reservoir leaks a little bit more, which makes sense, uh, there's more pressure. When the reservoir is, is drawn down, like this time of the year, it leaks less. So what Dave is looking for as he's going, looking, dipping down into these more or less wells is to see if there are indicators that there is a significantly increase, a significant increase of water in that well compared to last year at that time when the lake elevation was rather similar. And then if there is, we move that information up to our Portland District uh, Engineering Division, uh, they check uh, a little bit longer historical records. Dave also checks to see what the clarity of the water is that's coming out of the dam. Because again, all dams leak some. If it's clear water, and it hasn't changed significantly from the previous month or the previous years, we just continue to monitor it. If it turns cloudy, Dave used the term piping. Piping is when some of that interior part of the dam would be drawn out kind of as, as a little riverlet was working its way through the dam. So if we were to see cloudy water coming through, that would be an indicator that there may be something up and we would do additional investigations. Uh, on an annual basis, the dam gets a top to bottom uh, inspection from our Portland District engineers. Every four or five years, it's, it's that plus the next level. So um, it is a, a highly inspected dam but not one where we have an electronic system that would let us know if something moved a tenth of an inch uh, in a moment. Is there, has there been any changes in those measurements since the dam to this day? So certainly there have been uh, some changes because, uh, uh, like us, the, the dam has aged. Mm -hmm. There's been no unexpected changes. The, the changes we see at this dam are the changes that we'd expect to see at any dam 
that was completed in about 1977, uh, and then Applegate 1980. So nothing out of the ordinary has happened. Dave, uh, probably one of the reasons a lot of people here are interested in, in ourselves included, is they're talking more and more, more about a major earthquake, not if, but when, and it's going to happen here. Is the dam, is it set for a certain, I mean, if it goes over a 10 or a, I mean, 10 is way out there, but something <laughs> 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 or a 5, or is there something that it has been stressed or checked for stress to, and we don't want to see one higher than that, or is it pretty resilient? I would say pretty resilient is an accurate characterization, generally speaking. But when we get questions about how big of a magnitude these dams can withstand, it's really a tough question to answer because magnitude is a measure of how much energy is released in the event. So the analogy that I like to give people is if you had a firecracker and it went off in your hand, with your hand closed around it, it's going to do a lot of damage. But if you have that same firecracker and your hand is open, or the firecracker is distantly located, right. it's the same amount of energy. It's the same magnitude. So with earthquakes, that magnitude depends on pro proximity to where you are. It depends on which way the earth moves. Does Is that offset sliding horizontally? Is it moving up and down? <coughs> so there's really no way to say if there's a magnitude whatever, this is kind of what we can expect. If I may, so uh, my understanding is that we are in a cycling zone three, and when that dam was built, it was probably based on whatever criterion design was established at that time uh, for that seismic zone. And we all know that the codes change periodically. I was involved before it's been updated every three years. I used to, where I lived previously, we had the dam go through twice through seismic upgrades. So currently it is the dam in compliance with, 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 let's say, the current standards, if, if it were to be built today, or is it only in compliance when it was legal, non legally built at that time? And are there any plans to maybe go in there and do some seismic upgrades to the dam, since we know the standards change over time? So I, I can't speak to seismic standards in effect now. It's just out of my okay. field of view. Uh, what I can tell you is that we currently have an effort ongoing to do the study, to see what we can learn from anticipated effects of a Cascadia subduction zone event and how that's going to affect Applegate and Lost Creek camps. So we're trying to answer that question. I can't tell you how it stands with standards that have progressed over time because I'm just not familiar with those. But hopefully we'll have an ability to give you a better answer once that study is complete. Uh, do you know, Jim, what, what the outlook is on this CSC? I do not. I do know that uh, with the uh, uh, large earthquake in Japan a couple of years ago and then uh, in Chile uh, a few years prior to that, a uh, dam similar to Lost Creek and Applegate fared very well. Out of 230 some in Japan, uh, I think there was one. Uh, earth embankment dam that was built many, many, many years ago that uh, failed, no others failed, not saying there wasn't any damage. So the best that we know, I'll just echo what Dave said, to the specific answer to the question of do we know if it was a 9.0, you know, off of uh, Bandon, uh, how will Applegate and how will Lost Creek react? We don't know specifically. We do believe from what we know is that um, there would not be a catastrophic failure, but there would be some damage. That's what we know at the, at the time being. Okay. Oh, yes. Who conducts those studies? Uh, are engineers in, in Portland District engineers or is it subcontracted out? Well, it, it, could, it would probably be a mix. Uh, we do contract out a lot of work, and then we do the quality assurance if, will any of that go to an NGO that is not part of the engineers or would have slowed the field? I, I don't know the answer to that. It would, if, if we went out to contract, it would, it would go out to contract and then the results <coughs> would be reviewed by the board. And the important part of the board, think about what magnitude was it built to extend? 
I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that. And as Dave mentioned, magnitude is is part of it, but magnitude of the earthquake and where that earthquake is located. Um, if we had a, a a magnitude four here, we'd be in pretty good shape. Uh, if we had a magnitude seven right under the dam, that's a whole different uh, situation. But this Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, that's kind of newer information. Uh, and more information is coming out about that all the time. Isn't a clay core rock based dam, and these dry winters and dry summers have more impact on the clay inside. I know when you finish the project, you were concerned about the speed and the fill. So you think the dryness could have an impact also? Yeah, I haven't heard any discussion about that being a concern. Whenever you're filling a dam, uh, Dave, I think, showed one slide that said, that showed some percentages of failures after the first five years. Those first couple of years when you're filling, that is a critical time. As far as having dry years, we filled Lost Creek this year, like we did last year, and, and almost every year. So the inner core gets the same amount of wetness. And again, if we see that there's a significant difference in the leakage, then we know that there may be an issue. And and have you, how frequently have you seen those indicators and, and what kind of repairs have you done above and below the water line? Yeah. Dang. I'm sorry, indicators of? Well, the cloudy water, as Jim described. And okay. Uh, the, the only possible indicators that we've seen of that happen at Lost Creek and it's a seasonal event is what we've been able to determine so we have a what we call a weir that lets water collect in a channel just downstream of the dam and then is piped to a particular location where it drains out into the river and we have a measuring device at that point to check for the flow rate and to check for clarity in the rainy parts of the year, so over the winter, early spring, what we'll see is a little bit of cloudiness developing in that water, and it clears up as soon as the rain goes by. So we've had we've had pictures of that. We've communicated that issue with our dam safety section. It's been looked at several times, and the conclusion for that is that it's water that's filtering through the ground and grabbing some of the clay-type material that is just naturally present in the ground and is then manifesting itself into uh, into that weir that's draining down into the river. There's no correlation with other seasonal variations. There's no correlation with changing um, depth of the dam. There's no correlation with the amount of water that we let out of the dam. It's all just with the rainy season. Are you seeing a trend of increase Increase in instances of those indicators. It's stable. It's it's a it's, it's typical it's routine, pattern. It's cyclical. Not enough to get under the water and make any repairs or reinforcements or anything. Uh, well, there's no repairs that's necessary for that. That's just a, a natural phenomenon that happens whenever water percolates through the ground. Yes. Uh, I have a question. We live on the irrigation, but the irrigation, and not to take away from the um, earthquake matter that we're dealing with here, but we had a meeting last night, and it was told to us that the Corps of Engineers was going to be letting a lot of water out of um, Lost Creek to the point that by the 11th, we were going to have a damp ditch, no water. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we should be concerned about? Is this just a, a rumor? Are we letting out water? A lot of water? We're, we're currently letting out water within the guidelines of our water control manual. So we are going to see the water come down uh, somewhat lower than what we typically see. Uh, we're on a pattern now that, that mimics what we saw in 2001. So uh, for those people that were here, they were coming down, uh, what, maybe 40 feet below what our normal low elevation is, is what we're anticipating. But to describe it as a ditch behind the dam would not be a good characterization. 
And did you describe an irrigation district that you're a part of? Gold Hill Irrigation District. Okay, Gold Hill. So downstream. Downstream. So uh, as far as downstream, uh, we're currently releasing about 1,750 cubic feet per second. Over this weekend, actually, we're going to be dropping that down a little bit so that by uh, 8 o'clock Monday, I think we're coming down to about 1,400 cubic feet per second. So actually, we're going to be cutting back because we're getting into the spring chinook spawning season. So we won't be, there's not going to be a rush of water. Actually, it's going to be a gradual reduction over the next uh, probably week and a half. That's what they said. By the 11th, we will be down to 9,000. Uh, actually, around 900. 900. Okay, 900. yeah. So, so that, so is, we, that is rather accurate. So we really wouldn't be having anything in our ditch. We would be oh, oh, okay. I see, I see the point that you're making. Well, it's... For this time of the year to be at uh, at 900 uh, is not a new precedent. I mean, it's we have been this low, uh, probably 2001 would have been another year at least. I kind of think we're going to be around 1,000 instead of 900 for fisheries purposes. But again, whether 100 CFS makes any difference to your irrigation, I, I don't know. Is there any reason we're doing this at this time of the year when it's still in our season? Uh, it's specifically driven by fisheries. So right now, spring chinook will be uh, spawning, and we want to have the, the river down low for that spawning period. And last year when they did this to us, when the Water Watch came in and um, did their diversion, they promised us that we wouldn't have a problem with next this year, and you turning off our water, well, you're not turning it off, you're just giving, we're just not getting enough to give us any irrigation. Okay. This couldn't be put, it was put off last year because enough people put up a stink. And uh, is this not something that you can put off until our season is over with because it's so dry again? And we had this issue last year. It's just coming in from the back door now. It's yeah. the Corps of Army Engineers, uh, not Water Watch. Yeah. So um, I, I would think that the irrigation district has a direct link with um, Travis Kelly, the uh, the he's Oregon Water Resource Department. The water, yeah, he's a water master. Water master. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why we'd be chatting with. He's on every Wednesday afternoon. We have a, a coordination call with ODF and W and, and Travis. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we approached him last year when Water Watch was doing this to us, and he pretty much told us that this the only time that he got involved, the county issue was the um, if people were stealing water, using water out of turn. Otherwise. He's kind of impotent to do anything about this particular problem. Yeah, at this time of the year, us cutting back the release has been a tradition for a number of years. But not this much. We've always had water until they shut <coughs> down completely to do the irrigation diversion. But so we are all dealing with unusually less water this year because of the drought. But being in the thousand CFS release, that's that's been kind of a tradition for a number of years. That, that number I would have to check with them and see if they're going. Dave mentioned you're going to be 40 feet below uh, Norm when you put them out. You're going to be at about 1772? That's, that, I, I would say I, I don't have a, a number, Tom, right in my mind. But it, 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 is the one you, you shoot at every year, isn't it? That's Eight right. 12, okay. yes. So it's 40 feet below that? Yeah. That, that's, about, you, that's what about, you anticipate yeah. being? Yes. Oh, okay. So, so that's a <coughs> projection that Understand comes out in June. Okay. So, thank you. I have a question <coughs> regarding uh, the construction of the dam originally and how it was uh, maybe the materials. I don't know. Let's talk dam building. The materials. I understand was a lot of rock that came out of the surrounding hills there. And does it make a difference much uh, as far as the sturdiness of the dam? in what material would go into building a dam like that? Yeah, absolutely. The, the selection of materials is a key consideration in the construction of any of these types of dams. And what you don't see is the layers and the types of materials that are interior to those rock faces. And the, the, in, the very innermost core of the dam is essentially a, a type of clay that's impermeable and then get out to some type of a sandy material that's meant to keep the, the clay in place and then we get gradually larger material generally speaking as we move outward and the 
when the dams are constructed, the size of the material and the density of the material is all taken into consideration when they determine you know, how big do we make it. So, yeah, it, it's all taken into account. Could I specifically describe the specifications for this dam? No. But, yeah. Well, how, how, <coughs> how close, if you, if you said, here's a dam, we're going to build a dam and we want it make the dam as stable as possible. Mm -hmm. And so what, in this case, what materials, which I, I assume the materials are all pretty much on hand, the mountains uh, from uh, the river, uh, what materials went into this dam that could give us give it a certain ability of maintaining the dam <coughs> Ideal structural way. Right. Is that? Like, I guess I'll just kind of uh, uh, paraphrase a bit what David said. You know, there's there's a, a clay core where that came from. Uh, maybe Sands Valley. I, I don't know. We do have a, a rock pit that uh, was just across Highway 62 from the dam location. Some rock came from that. And it's this building of different zones of the clay. And then as Dave mentioned, on the downstream side in particular, there's a zone of sand to keep the clay from migrating downstream. Because again, this dam, like all the dams, it does leak. But that, that downstream zone keeps the core in place. And then downstream of that sand is small rock and then it gets to bigger and bigger rock. So really what you see at Lost Creek, you'd almost think it was, it was a rock-filled dam because you see that big riprap, which is actually the protection, really just on downstream from, uh, from rain and, and <coughs> snow and that type of thing, and to add weight to it. On the upstream side, it provides protection uh, also from waves just caused by boating activity and, and wind. So I, I don't think I quite got to the core of your question, but that's about the best I have. Well, it was sort of, if you had a score of, of, of the best possible dam, and one that's not maybe built to that highest criteria, where would this dam, and maybe that's an unanswerable question, but where would this dam be on that score? So uh, within the Corps of Engineers Dam Safety Program nationwide, there's a score of one to five. One is, we wouldn't want to be here right now. Five is, you just build it and nothing has happened. And we're a four. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're near the gold standard. There, there are no fives in the Corps of Engineers. That, that's right, yes. Well, versus, versus a concrete dam. Yeah, well, uh, a concrete dam, again, the reason you go with concrete is just because of site uh, characteristics. Both, you know, Elk Creek was was a, uh, a concrete dam because of site characteristics. Both Applegate and uh, Lost Creek, because of the site, uh, earthen dam was uh, the preferred choice there. Tom? We need to wrap it up. We have a council meeting. We have to get started. If you're going to have the meetings, the plural, on the 21st. Right. So, so again, this, yeah, th this was just intended to be a brief version of the more extended version that's intended for the public meetings. This was a presentation for the study session for the, for the City Council. So if you still have questions, we encourage you to show up on the 21st here at the library. Uh, 3 o'clock will be our first session, 4 o'clock the next session, 6.30 and 7.30 for the next two. Because, as you can see, this is a lot of information, some of it's very complex, we're trying to limit the amount of people at each session. So pre-registration is required to guarantee you a seat. Uh, we'll be putting out a notice on how to register for that next week. So, thank you. Um, thank that's you very much. Appreciate Thank you. Stay session. Sure.